You can go. But, <laughs> um, great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, our last talk today is um, uh, on international vaccination and its potential impact on viral evolution. And we have Jessica Metcalf from Princeton University um, who will be speaking. So um, if Jessica could switch her video on. Uh, it's on, I think. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, it is. Sorry, I couldn't see you. Hi, welcome, Jessica. Hi. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for having me. I'm going to, I'm sorry to say I missed many of the previous talks, but I look forward to seeing the recordings. Um, I'm going to be talking about potential impacts on viral evolution. And of course, we care about viral evolution for three reasons. We care about variants that are more transmissible, more severe, or that escape immunity better. And mutation, as everyone on this call knows, is a continuous process. It's sort of like spelling mistakes, but the changes in sequences that lead to changes in proteins that lead to these different features are the ones that will be of concern to us. It's easy to see that a more transmissible variant is likely to spread more. And this is something that we have observed when I wrote this talk, it was about Alpha and Delta, and of course now we have Omicron. Um, one can imagine also that a, um, some of the ways in which it might happen, so a sort of stickier viral particle might also you know, uh, move more rapidly between people. A variant that's more severe sh on its own shouldn't have any advantage. At best, it might be neutral. At worst, it might actually reduce the fitness of the virus because um, individuals who are severely affected by the infection might be, you know, not moving around and transmitting the virus. If it's fatal, of course, they're taken out of the transmission equation altogether. And finally, being able to spread. So we only really expect severity to spread if it's associated with some other trait. I mean, escape, being able to spread through both immune as well as non-immune of individuals obviously increases the potential for spread. Um, this won't be... Um, this, this might not be optimal, but it depends on the specific circumstances and different trade-offs between the different features. And indeed, what we've seen to date suggests that all these different traits are interdependent. So transmissibility might walk with severity, the degree of immune escape might also move with transmissibility, and this is associated with the fact that many of the key mutations seem to be tied up in what's happening in the spike mutation, at least to date, with complexities added on. A little while ago, with colleagues um, led by Rose Ego and Julia Gog, we were charged to think about what might happen in the context of dose sharing from the UK. So this entails in part thinking about what would happen once a variant of concern, what it would take and what would happen once a variant of concern gets to the UK. And the logic is really rather simple. A variant first has to appear through mutation in some probably unknown source location. The variant will establish transmission in that location and then through some convoluted pathway, presumably will be imported into the UK and established transmission in the UK. Um, much, uh, much work has suggested that, of course, screening for borders is quite hard. And so it makes sense to step back and think about the international picture, which is the bigger picture and think about what it would take to try and move towards a reduction in the risk of those variants emerging at all. And the big picture is quite simple. The more circulation globally means more opportunity to variants, for variants to emerge. There may well be circumstances where combinations of traits do better. So for example, perhaps immune escape traits will be doing better in partially immunized populations or immunized through some combination of vaccination, et cetera, et cetera. But there's just so much going on and so much correlation between these different traits at this stage that it's very hard to pin this down with any certainty. Um, it's very hard to say, you know, in this, in this particular public health situation, we think that it's most likely that variants of concern might emerge. There has been some suggestion that partially immunized individuals or individuals who are immunosuppressed for one reason or another might end up being um, a context where variants of concern could uh, bubble along accumulating mutilations for a while, but I don't think there's terribly strong evidence for that yet. Um, although that there is, there are several lines of evidence suggested, but we certainly haven't uh, haven't pinned that down yet. And that means that the big picture just comes back around to the fact that more circulation globally means more opportunity for variants to emerge. And so, as much as possible, we should be spreading doses 
to try and reduce circulation of the virus. But within that very big picture, I'm going to narrow in on two features, which is think a little bit about what we might be able to say about the spread of immune escape. Um, and this is one where, as I've hinted at already, the context, the population substrate that the virus is spreading of it is really going to matter. And I'm also going to think a little bit about the future of severity, because this is, of course, something that um, as speculation runs rife over Omicron is clearly something that is going to shape our future. And just a reminder of how the biology works, although I don't think anyone needs a reminder at this stage, um, the virus binds ACE2 cells, starts to replicate somewhere in the upper respiratory tract. There are worse symptoms generally associated with replication lower in the lungs. Um, and hopefully the virus will be cleared by immunity. And it should be noted, of course, that immunity also drives many of the symptoms. Once you've been infected or vaccinated, the hope is that infection is blocked. So there might be a tiny amount of replication, but um, one would aspire to a situation where replication is entirely blocked by, for example, immunoglobulin A in the mucosa or antibodies in the serum. So the virus just really doesn't get anywhere. This uh, may not be the case. We know that breakthrough infections happen. Um, there's increasingly suggestions that this might be in part because uh, associated at least with declining levels of antibodies, which is something that we expect and expected. IgA and IgG both decline over time following uh, the primary boost. And this is because short-lived plasma blast populations are falling. Antibodies have quite a long half-life, but we only expect them to kind of stick around from three weeks to a month. And then there's a handover to the longer lived memory cells. Um, so, and, and in, in particular, it's, it's been suggested that the um, IgA is not terribly well elicited by immunity. So you might in particular lose that protection against infection altogether, but you might retain protection against disease, which is generated by things like IgG, which might be lower down in the respiratory tract. So the, there are host characteristics that might um, facilitate the uh, occurrence of breakthroughs that have to do with the particular moment in time we're in relative to waning of immunity. There might also be, of course, breakthroughs that would have happened anyway, because levels of immunity are heterogeneous across populations. There are also viral characteristics that will enable breakthroughs. So new variants might pop up that are invisible to immunity, so that have changed their shape so much that our antibodies can't see them anymore. They might simply be, this has been suggested for Delta, present at such high titers that they manage to overwhelm the kind of resting immunity that's in our upper respiratory tract. Or they might be replicating so fast that they get ahead of that uh, protective response coming up. So both features of the host and features of the virus can shape the propensity to break through infections. Clearly, these are going to matter, and these are really going to matter in the thinking about how an immune escape variant might spread you really need to think about how these intersect with the population context. Um, and the way I'm sure Caroline has introduced already, but and this is also work done with Chadi, the way we can frame this is by thinking about two parameters, alpha, which captures the relative transmission rate of secondarily infected individuals. So if I've had COVID before, or if I've been vaccinated before, and I'm infected again, how much less, and we expect it to be less, will I transmit than an average infected individual? but also the relative susceptibility to breakthrough infection. So if I've had COVID before, or if I've been vaccinated before, how susceptible am I to being infected again? And we would expect it to be a little bit less. We should be less susceptible. Um, so alpha, it should be said, seems to be close to one for Delta. There seems to be relatively high transmission from people um, who are infected on breakthrough infections from, for Delta at least. Um, it's possibly a shorter transmission period, but, uh, but it doesn't seem like it's very much diminished, at least in viral load and such things, although, again, it's very hard to measure all these things with precision. Whereas epsilon is potentially reduced. Epsilon equals zero would equate to perfect and lifelong transmission blocking immunity, and that's clearly not happening with these coronaviruses, so that would be SIR dynamics. Whereas epsilon equals one would correspond to an SIRS model, and that's also clearly not where we are where every individual that was immunized would, would wane back to being fully susceptible. But what uh, Chadi put together was a model where you think about these two parameters and put them in the context of thinking about, you know, you, the co population context, as I mentioned, is clearly going to matter because these all have to do with how one infected individual shapes the infection potential around them and one infected individual with a breakthrough infection. 
So we can ask to kind of narrow down and simplify the problem, what would happen in a country that had achieved herd immunity, that had vaccinated its population successfully when an immune escape variant was introduced? And in a way, it's a very simple problem. You can just, uh, if you assume just that alpha is basically one for simplicity, you can show that um, what we have is that the growth rate, the R effective essentially of this breakthrough, this, this um, immune escape variant is going to be some combination of the R effective occurring in totally susceptible individuals. That's the first term there. And then occurring in vaccinated individuals, because we're assuming that herd immunity basically reflects vaccination. And these two combined have to be equal to one. And this simple expression probably reveals that the vaccinated individuals, even if they're not transmitting as much, their sheer numbers can kind of potentiate the spread of this virus. So you can end up with rather big outbreaks. And you can collect, connect this to final size um, estimates, which, which um, you know, show, to show potentially large numbers and get a spectrum of dynamics depending on the characteristics of the vaccine escape variant. So this is just showing for different values of R0. The red vertical line on each panel shows you what uh, level the um, in invader has the same R0 as the resident. And um, the dashed lines are the proportion of susceptibles that are infected, and the black lines are the proportion of the um, vaccinated that are, that are infected. And the x-axis in each case is this epsilon. So zero would be no escape, and uh, you move up to higher and higher levels. Sorry, no, no risk of in susceptibility to breakthrough infection, relative susceptibility, and then you move up to higher and higher levels. And you can see that you can end up with very large uh, proportions of cases in susceptible individuals potentiated by the occurrence of infections in vaccinated individuals, which just reminds us all over again that this, uh, this whole pandemic is very much a numbers game and it's a balance of transmission and immunity. So who's susceptible and who isn't? A combination of infection of remaining susceptibles and breakthrough infections of vaccines can promote infection of invading variants, even when vaccination rates are high and their onward transmission is relatively low. So it really makes the point that this is a population specific question and the you know, problem of prediction gets harder and harder as we move into these more and more complicated landscapes of immunity for these sorts of uh, immune escape variants. So that's one piece. Um, another piece that is, of course, uh, of, of tremendous interest here is thinking about the future of severity and what the future of the severity of this infection might look like in the context of heterogeneous vaccination. And I'm sure that this is, this is work by my brilliant graduate student, Ian Miller, and really very much driven by him. Um, and what he was immediately started thinking about was the very classic um, theme in evolutionary ecology of infectious diseases, which is where if there is an association between virulence and transmission, then we actually expect there to be an optimal intermediate level of virulence. So what's shown on the left-hand side here is that transmission goes up as virulence goes up, and virulence might be how sick you're feeling, transmission is literally that beta term, and this might be just simply because of, you know, the higher viral titers in your lungs might be more likely to kill you or take you out of movement, but also result in more um, viral particles per unit time landing in somebody else. Because of that propensity to, to kill you or take you out of movement, you see that the time there is available for transmission goes down, so you're producing more virus per unit time or more infections, more new infections, but you're doing it for less time, so you end up with that third curve, which is an intermediate optimal offense. So does this matter for SARS-CoV-2? There's a couple of questions you have to answer before you can start thinking about whether it matters or not. And the first question is, is the evolution of increased transmission even possible for this virus? And the second question is, is increased transmission linked to increased virulence? And the answer to the first question is obviously and sort of horribly yes. We've seen increases of R0 of around two as we moved from alpha, um, you know, from, from the ancestral strain to alpha and the alpha to delta. Uh, the second question is, is a little more complicated. It seems like it might be that, but I think the jury is still out on the degree to which this relationship is so solid or you know, um, repeatable. In is increased transmission linked to increased virulence? There certainly did seem to be higher rates of hospitalization associated with alpha and perhaps also with delta, and which were both more transmissible. We obviously don't know yet about Omicron and we won't know for a little while. Um, but, uh, you know, this also suggests that we, we, there's no like, there's no uh, clear arrow pointing to the future for this particular set of mutations. However, the answer to the first is yes, the answer to the second is sometimes, so it might be worth thinking through the logic of what this means for this virus and what this means for this virus, particularly in the context of 
heterogeneous international vaccination. Uh, a quick reminder again of how the biology works and it was part of Ian's brilliance to note that this particular separation between the zone of transmission, so the upper respiratory tract, and the situation where the symptoms are worse, so the lower respiratory tract, actually opens the door to slightly worrying potentials around the evolution of virulence. Um, and this uh, was reinforced by the fact, this is built, of course, by brilliant work originally by Sylvain Gandon, who showed that if vaccines reduce symptoms, and there is a relationship between symptoms and transmission, you can end up by vaccinating, selecting for worse virulence. So given the different effects of the upper and lower respiratory tract on transmission and virulence, Ian thought this was an area where the bore consideration for this particular virus. Um, in particular, given that primate challenge studies early on seem to suggest that the vaccines were providing better protection in the lower respiratory tract than in the upper respiratory tract. Again, providing the separation and suggesting the separation that would be required for these outcomes to occur. Again, enormous amounts are unknown. It's very hard to pin down any of these levels with uncertainty. With, sorry, with, <laughs> it is very easy to pin them down with uncertainty. There are huge amounts of uncertainty. Um, and yet we thought it might be worth just laying down a really simple framing of what we might expect to occur in a broad range of, of sort of fairly pessimistic scenarios. Um, we put this in a transmission model form where we assume that transmission comes, part of transmission comes from the upper respiratory tract and part of transmission comes from the lower respiratory tract with different contributions to the overall transmission. Um, and that severity was associated with infection in the lower respiratory tract. So there's basically two compartments going on. Um, and that vaccines could protect, or an end immunity generally could protect against the upper respiratory tract or the lower respiratory tract. Um, and it, we were focusing on the impact of, of vaccines in the settings. And we used a little bit about what we knew to do with the R0 and the uh, severity of alpha and delta to sort of pin down what these relationships might look like. We used very phenomenological trade-offs to bound this problem because again, we don't know exactly what's going on. And then we placed it within an adaptive dynamics framework to sort of think about what we would expect for different, the spread of different variants uh, and when, where the virus would end up in terms of its optimal virulence. So that's what I'm gonna show here. So on the y-axis is lower respiratory tract protection. So how good the vaccine is at preventing infection in the lower respiratory tract, which will to some degree reduce transmission, but will absolutely reduce severity. Um, and how good it is at preventing um, infection in the upper respiratory tract, which it will have the effect of really reducing transmission, but will have negligible effects on, um, on virulence. And so, Putting these uh, two bits together, what we broadly expect before, before even sort of walking into this is that as the lower respiratory tract in protection increases, because this walks alongside reducing that transmission from the lower respiratory tract, we actually expect that to result in higher optimal virulence. So higher, the virus should be selected to increase its transmission by increasing its virulence. Um, and this again, would be something that wouldn't manifest in people who are vaccinated, but would manifest in people unvaccinated, and thus it would be a great concern in a, in a heterogeneous, heterogeneous world. Upper respiratory tract in protection, since it has very little effect on severity, won't drive selection on optimal severity particularly, but what it might do is just by declining, um, by reducing incidence, um, we might move towards herd immunity, so we might move into a place where it's actually very hard for new variants to establish because there's just not a lot of virus circulating. And the results, so we looked across a, a broad spectrum of um, different parameter sets, um, and the results all look a bit like this, where the colors show increasing optimal severity, so the virus moving towards greater severity, and again to say this is in a context where there is an association between virulence and transmission in the lower respiratory tract, given the set of parameters, so we don't know that any of this is particularly uh, set in stone, but it gives a sort of very big picture effect. Um, and you can see that as lower respiratory tract protection increases as predicted, you end up with a higher optimal severity. And the gray area shows where it's just dri driven to ever more increasing uh, optimal severity. So it's just this accelerating selection towards virulence. 
Um, and then as you move along to the right of this plot, what you see is a selection towards, uh, it's what you see is sort of very little gradient of selection as we expected, but there comes a point where there's white on the graph and that corresponds to where there's so much upper respiratory tract pr protection that you basically moved into a situation of herd immunity. And so the, the virus isn't spreading anymore, so you're not getting, getting evolution. Okay. So, and um, we did this, our model was extremely simple. Um, we did not formally include waning within it. You can imagine waning as being something that moves you around on this map in terms of where you are in the upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract protection. And by using the adaptive dynamics framework, we are assuming that there's very rapid, uh, extremely rapid selection, extremely rapid you know, spread of variants within populations, but there doesn't seem to be any reason not to assume this, at least based on the last couple of weeks. Okay, so the future of severity based on this sort of very thousand mile view model of what might go on is that if severity and transmission are linked, and again, this is an if, um, under pessimistic assumptions around this, possible futures are unbounded selection for increased virulence. This is really the worst case scenario. An intermediate optimal of increased virulence, and it might not be very different from, from what we observe now, or you know, moving towards herd immunity blocking or reducing uh, what the evolutionary potential is. It's incredibly hard to, to monitor this for this, right? As we're seeing with Omicron right now, looking at the degree to which uh, these infections are severe or not is hard enough, even without considering the fact that the population on which this is occurring is extremely heterogeneous uh, in all sorts of different ways. And our, our registration systems often struggle. The delays make it, make it very hard to make timely uh, inference into what's going on. Um, and the, the other sort of complexity that is always going on in these situations is that there is a shifting standard of care. We get better and better at caring for people. So all of these things together um, suggest that it would actually be quite hard to figure out whether we were seeing selection for increased virulence, particularly also since we would see this, the, the most obvious signs of this would be in unvaccinated populations and people, places where people remain unvaccinated are often places where surveillance is really hard as well. So it's certainly something uh, to, to, um, to bear in mind, but it's something that will be, as for so many things with these virus, very hard to, to maintain eyes upon. So I gave you, I talked through two instances of some work by two different graduate students from Princeton thinking about what might happen in a heterogeneously vaccinated international context for two different um, aspects of selection on the virus. The spread of immune escape, which is highly predicated on the kind of patchwork quilt of immunity that is in, within populations, and the future of severity. And all of the nuances of both these things really hinge on details of the biology, on details of how the you know, trade-offs between the different aspects of change within the virus play out. So is an increase in transmission associated with an increase in severity or maybe a decline, or are there different parts of the space? It may, you know, it might be nowhere near the edges of its trade-off yet. We just don't know these things. And we don't know how immunity translates into selection pressures within any individual, let alone across landscapes. So I think that puts us back in the big picture that I started off with uh, when I started this talk which is that um, more circulation means more opportunity for variants to emerge. And it's hard to understand the situations that are propitious for spread of particular variants. So we should just, uh, we should be sharing doses and reducing transmission as much as we possibly can. Every new infection is an opportunity for a new mutation. Um, and of course we should be monitoring and trying to understand this as well as possible. And we should you know, be trying to get ahead of measurement along these three axes, mapping them. I mean, the dream would be a genotype to phenotype map, but I think we're, we're a long way from that yet, of course. Um, and this work was very much driven by Ian Miller, who's a graduate student in my lab, and Chadi Sadroy, who's a graduate student with Brian Grenfell, who has worked a lot with Caroline, who spoke earlier. Um, I was part of a group uh, led by Ros Ego and Julia Gogg, which thought about these problems a bit, which was great fun. And I'm currently on sabbatical at the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, which I'm very much enjoying. So uh, thank you and delighted to take any questions. Um, thank you very much, um, 